everyone uh, welcome back um, right okay um, right I can see a question here from Christopher so we there were two points that you had mentioned at the close of the last session the second one was that we are all pilgrims um, what was the first point um, so as we were talking about the second altar right Christopher uh, you were calling it the altar of intimacy and the pilgrim walk right um, so the first point is basically that uh, in our walk as Christians uh, we need to grow in intimacy um, and also keeping in mind at the same time that we are all pilgrims and that we are not of this world so that's just the two points all right everybody else uh, doing all right uh can you guys with me hope you're learning something yes sir okay all right all right um so if we take a look at uh page five at the very bottom of your notes um it says once again from hebrews 11 9 i just want to read that for us uh, even when he reached the land god promised him uh, he lived there by faith this is the scriptures telling about the way Abraham lived his life, guys. Right? For he was like a foreigner living in tents, right? Um, so, what's the significance of a tent? Is it you're not you're not just uh, you know you're not putting a foundation to it. There's no bunch of concrete and bricks and stones and whatnot. It's very easy to pack and move on. Right, uh, more like the Bedouins, Bedouin tribe, those shepherds, uh, you know, they would live in the wilderness in the tents, right? So that's more like it. So living in the tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who who inherited the same promise. Right, so that the temporary nature of the tent bears testimony to his willingness to have no roots in this world, except to be a pilgrim in it. Okay, let's take a look at Acts chapter 7, verse 5, and come down uh, to page 6. And I've, it, I've mentioned this in your notes. Acts chapter 7, verse 5, it says, He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. Right, even but he Abraham knew. Right, Abraham just knew at that point that, you know, I'm going to live as a pilgrim. Right, but he's he's promised me, and I'm just going to obey his voice. I'm going to I'm going to let him lead me. I'm going to trust him. Right. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. This is a quote uh, from Thomas R. Taylor. I just thought it was very interesting. It says, but I am but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. Earth is a desert. Heaven is my home. Danger and sorrow stand around me on every hand. Heaven is my fatherland. Heaven is my home. Right. So as the children of God in our time, we too are called upon to live as pilgrims in this world. Uh, and more on this, uh, you know, we we'll see in the in the next altar that Abraham built is the altar of commitment and separation. Okay, so once again, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter twelve. Um, I want to read for us from uh, verse eight, just so we get the context. It says, "From there he went on toward the hill east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east." There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This was the second one, right? Verse 9. <clears throat> then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev, the Negev wilderness, the desert. Verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will 
kill me but will let you live okay uh, we know the remainder of the story so from verse 10 from verse 10 to verse 20 uh, the next 10 verses of uh, genesis 12 is about abraham in um, in egypt right I guess, uh, do you need me to uh, project the notes for us? Uh, please let me know. I, I, sorry, I didn't realize that I had not shared my screen. Go ahead and do that. Okay. All right, so uh, we, we are talking about the third altar. Uh, the altar of commitment and separation i'm calling it that and you will see why in just a bit okay so later he went to another place hebron and built another altar in these three places abraham built three altars this altar is associated with abraham's communion and relationship with god so in abraham uh, in genesis 12 we see that he left he leaves the land okay that the land had promised him it said this is the land that you are to uh, you know to live and this is the land that I will be giving your descendants but uh, but during the uh, time of severe famine Abraham goes down to Egypt right um, and then when we come down now in his time in Egypt he comes out with um, I, I don't want to say headache but uh, he comes out of Egypt with uh, with two things. One, he becomes a very wealthy man, very rich. So he comes out of Egypt with great possession. So uh, I just want to read from my NKJV version very quickly in Exodus. Uh, sorry, in Genesis twelve. Uh, Genesis. Sorry, guys. Genesis 12 and uh, the last uh, so last verse uh, verse 20 Genesis 12 20 says so Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him Abraham and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had okay uh, Genesis chapter 13 Verse 1 says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him at, to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. Okay. Uh, now, uh, another one of the translations uh, of some, it says that he came out with, with great substance. Right? He came out with great possession or great substance. Um, and, and and that is such a foreshadowing of this. Uh, um, let's very quickly go to Genesis chapter fifteen. Okay, sorry, I'm making you read too many scriptures, too early in the morning, too many jumping around here and there. Okay, Genesis chapter fifteen. Okay, and verse twelve. Genesis fifteen, verse twelve. Okay. It says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into deep sleep, and a thick and a dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, okay, the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a strange land, in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Okay, they will come out with great substance. So there's a lot of things that's happening there. Uh, one is God is prophesying about uh, it, the people of Israel's time in Egypt, that they will be enslaved uh, for 400 years, that they will be in bondage. But when they come out, they're going to come out with great substance and uh, in a possession. That's exactly what is happening here in Genesis 12 and the early chapters of uh, verses of Genesis 13. It's like a foreshadow 
Right? It says when, Mo, when Abraham came out of Egypt, he came out with all that he had, with great substance and possession. Right? Um, and so now when you look at that, because he was rich, uh, there was a lot of friction that was happening between Abraham and, and his nephew Lot. Uh, when you go through the chapter 13, you will see, okay, you know, their, their livestock was way too much uh, and there was always quarreling happening right, between uh, Abraham and his nephew uh, Lot. But then there comes a point uh, Abraham says, okay, enough is enough. I've had enough. Um, why should we, you know, quarrel? The land is huge. We have enough space and whatnot. And then Abraham gives Lot a, the choice, right? Okay, you, you, you choose where you want to go. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you want to go to the right, uh, you know, I'll go to the left. Uh, one side note thing, which is not very important, uh, is the patriarchs of those days, would always take a use north as a compass, right? Which again happens most of the time, even this day is. So he was talking in reference to that. And say, okay, you go to the west, I'll go to the east. If you go to the east, I'll go to the west. Um, so that's what's happening there. And Lot chooses uh, to go to the land that is lush and green, uh, which is very, very, very close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, uh, and even at that time, it was known. Okay, if you look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, verse 12, it says, uh, Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, it says, Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the lord okay look at those words there i don't know what your translation says uh it says now the men of sodom were were past okay wicked and worsening that means they had already built a reputation of being very wicked people lot knew that but then he still chose to go towards that in that direction Right? Because okay, everything looked amazing. Now, so Lot went from living in the outskirts of the city, and then we get to know later that he was living among them. Right? Now, if I was a patriarch, if I was a leader, if I was the one who brought you out, right? If I had the, knowing that I have the authority, I would have told, okay, you know what? I'm gonna go there, you go there. But instead, Abraham gives Lot the ch you know, chance to choose. Um, and even in this, Abraham knew what Sodom and Gomorrah was all about. And they, were, and they were living a sinful life, wicked life. And sometimes the sin can be very exciting, very attracting, uh, you know, very inviting. But then Abraham chooses himself to set himself apart. He's like, no. I am not going to associate myself with wicked people. And that's what happens in Genesis chapter 13, verse 18. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Okay, uh, Mamre means manliness, and Hebron means society of or friendship stable strength firm right so with this altar in this move abraham desired to separate himself to the lord away from sodom and gomorrah okay, and uh, the hebrew uh, this verse in hebrews life chapter 11 verse 10 corresponds to this altar it says abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations a city designed and built by God. Okay, he was constantly looking, living life like a pilgrim. He said, okay, you know, none of these earthly things are going to attract me. I've left everything, my, my home, my, my land, and I've come in search. And then Hebrews 11.10 says, he was constantly looking for a city with eternal foundations. A city that was designed and built by God. And which is why Abraham was not even tempted uh, to, to, to choose a land that was just so 
uh, that looked very green and lush and flourishing and fertile. It didn't matter to him because he was not looking for it. He was not attracted by it. But his eyes and his heart were set on something bigger. Right? So not only did he live a pilgrim's life, denying himself the pleasures of this world, but he took a step of separating himself to God. He wanted to be in communion with his Lord in the quiet place of fellowship, Hebron. Okay, uh, another the Hebrew word for holy is set apart. Right? When we say God is holy, we simply say that he is set apart. That means there is no one like him. Right? And I, I'm and forgive me if I've used these examples before, uh, and if you remember, is that there is not a single creature on earth or in heaven that God can point his finger and say, um, I am like him. If, if an alien, a Martian, so to speak, would come to earth and say, like, who are you? What are you? I can point my finger and say, I'm a human being, like like Charles, like Prabhakar, like, or like all of you guys. But, that's what holy is when we say God is holy. There is not a single angel that he can point his finger out and say, I'm like that. Or a single molecule that he can say, okay, or I'm like this. God is set apart. And because he is set apart, he calls us to be set apart. And one of the recurring themes of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that God keeps saying that I will be your God, you will be my people. Simply means I'm setting yourself apart from me. I will be your God and you will be my people. I'm not going to share you with anybody else. Right? In Exodus chapter 19, when you read, he says, out of all the nations of the world, although the whole earth is mine, I have chosen you to be my holy nation, a treasured possession. What is he saying? That I've chosen you to be set apart for me. And that is the heart of our God, is that because he is holy, he's calling us to be holy. And Abraham gets this. And then he chooses, at the very early stage in his life, he chooses himself to set himself apart and not uh, to get mixed up with the world. And so that's where he builds that altar. And this altar is the altar of, of commitment and separation. Right? And finally, we come to the fourth altar, the altar of sacrifice. Uh, but before we go on, uh, do you have any questions, any thoughts, pointers, anything? That you're learning so far, because I'm I'm constantly talking. Sorry. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I've got one question. Uh, in Genesis 13, just the end of 12 and yeah. the be beginning of 13. Um, just wondering, is it possible that uh, There's some some history of Abraham that's are not recorded in the Bible because here it says that uh, 18 verse 1. Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and, and all that he had with Lot with him to the, to the south. And then from the south, then he went to to Bethel with gold and stuff. So yeah. Can you speculate that he might have went uh, gone to uh, Ethiopia or way uh, south away from from Egypt, even though it's not recorded? I know it's not to be recorded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. We certainly can speculate, thank you. Uh, you know, and uh, that's a good point as well because uh, not everything can be uh, will be will be recorded. I'm not too sure about that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, he's gone down south. Then, but the Bible very, is very clear that he says he comes back to the place where he uh, he he had built an altar that is Bethel, his second altar, right? Uh, so he must have gone down and then gone back up to the place. Uh, I don't know which route he must have taken, but 
uh, yeah. Does that answer? Yes. Yes, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Srikumar, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, my question is, um, uh, how it is going to imply as a Christian um, when Abraham was in the Old Testament and uh, and um, and he was not with Christ. So mm. is this? Uh, uh, do we also have this um, different altars uh, we have to make in our day-to-day uh, -day life, or um, or in Christ we can find everything? That's my question. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Shikuma. That's such a valid, uh, genuine question, right? Um, but so we are in the new covenant right uh, as as in the old testament in the old covenant we know that altars was a place of worship it was a place of sacrifice uh, where sacrifice were constantly uh, offered and if you read if uh, when we read leviticus chapter uh, 8 and 9 i guess i think I'm not too sure but you know priests would build altars and would place sacrifices constantly um, but jesus is our sacrifice he is our ultimate sacrifice right there is we don't need to take another sacrifice and you know uh and on the altar because the ultimate price is paid right the ultimate ultimate price is paid now all the blood uh, that was shed in the old testament it was covering for our sins it, it you know it we read that in time and time again but when Jesus is introduced by John the Baptist, he says, uh, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? That means he's not just covering our sins anymore, but he's completely cleansed us, uh, ransomed us. He's completely redeemed us. And so we walk the walk of faith as Christians, but what we do doesn't really matter. We, we don't, uh, it is, everything is given to us by grace. Right? We we uh, don't earn righteousness. Uh, you know. You, I hope you get what I'm saying, but it is by grace that you know we've been redeemed, we've been ransomed. Um, so uh, there's another point uh, as we walk uh, this Christian life, uh, we learn about that in this last altar, and I hope that will make sense uh, because there is one verse that I want to highlight as we conclude. Is that okay, Shrikumar? Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tarun, for sharing those scriptures as well. Um, so, the, his final altar, the altar of sacrifice, we all know about this, is Genesis chapter twenty-two, verse nine. Um, you know the story of Abraham taking his uh, son Isaac, because God tells him to go take him up and and to be sacrificed. Now we see how his life. His, uh, you know, has progressed from Genesis 12 and 10 chapters later. Uh, you know, when when you see Genesis 12, when God says leave, he just left, um, and then his his relationship with him has built, it's increasing, it's become very intimate, and now it's come to a point. Uh, you know, where God says, you know, I want your son, your only begotten son. Sounds very familiar, right? <laughs> Uh, and so let's just read the passage. It says, Then they came to a place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Uh, can I ask a very simple question to us? Although it was Isaac on the altar. Who do you think was really on the altar? Abraham? It's yeah, it's not a trick question. Yeah. You know, when he's waited for a son for a long, long time, finally the promises come and uh, and we can discuss about so many things about this, right? Um, it was, it, it was, I can't, we can't even express uh, how hard it must have been for Abraham to do this, right? So 
in all fairness it was actually abraham that was on the altar what do you what what, what, what do i mean by this right God did not want Isaac. He wanted the heart of Abraham. It was Abraham who was really upon the altar. Right in Hebrews 11, 17, 19, it says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. I mean, it's just so beautiful, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, we know about this person called Abraham and then he's known as the father of faith and whatnot but when we when you read the scriptures when you read the word of God of how the word of God testifies about this person called Abraham uh, it, it, it does it really does something to us isn't it that that he knew that okay even though that this was he, Isaac was the son that God promised that he will increase his descendants. He did not hold back and he kind of knew that, God, okay, even if Isaac dies, I know this God who is going to raise him back from the dead. You see the growth uh, in, of intimacy and faith in Abraham's journey, right? Uh, in his faith. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a, it is no wonder that under God, Abraham became the founder of a nation, the friend of God, the father of the faithful, and the fount of blessing to a lost world. He was truly a patriarch, a prophet, a prince, and a pilgrim. But uh, now, uh, Sri Kumar, just to answer your question, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right? Uh, we are very familiar with that scripture, isn't it? Now, Paul is challenging us to be, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, set apart. That means dying to ourselves every day as we walk this walk of, of faith. John H. Samus, he says, But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. And so as a conclusion of this section, uh, it's, it's very simple. I'll just stop presenting here is, God is not only asking us to build altars in our journey, that it's, as we, as we learned that altar is a place where we recognize, we acknowledge who God is. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of worship. And then we read Romans chapter 12, verse one, we sing, okay, we are not just called to build altars, but we are called to be on the altar. And so the question is, as worshippers, as ministers of God, one, are we building altars where we remind us of everything that He has done? And then are we on the altar, knowing that He is good, and so I'm going to lay my life down to the king who is worthy of it all. Right, so you guys, with me, so uh, I just want to end this session actually with that point and, uh, and not go any further. We'll resume uh, with the rest of the session next week. Yeah, uh, any thoughts, any, anything that you learned uh, that kind of stood out today? 
did you want to share before ending the class? Yes, Shri Kumar. Thank you. First, I just want to know at uh, the Romans chapter 12, uh, when we say, or as you said, um, all of uh, you have to be sacrificed. Yeah. So uh, can you uh, help me to understand that what exactly, um, uh, how I can implement this thing in my life or uh, yeah. how I can, that is something which I want to know. When I say that all of you have to be sacrificed, I want to know that how it can be implemented in my life. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, Shikumar. Yeah. Um, so uh, now this I wanted to have a follow up question so that we can answer it together. Okay. From Shri Kumar's question, as uh, from Romans 12 of 1, and the statement you've made that God is calling us not only to build altars, but to be on the altar. Does that one now connect with uh, Romans 12 of 1? That is the one that I wanted you to connect. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Yeah. yeah, I think a uh, short answer would be uh, yes, that uh, as in when I say, when we read the words, uh, Romans chapter 12, right? Uh, okay. Sorry. Right. Um, so uh, once again, if, I, if, if, if you don't mind, I'll re re read the Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. Uh, right, so, uh, Shri Kumar, so this would, again, vary from a person to person in terms how I can apply the self in my life. Uh, so as an individual, right, uh, what are the things of the world that, that, that tempts me, that attracts me, uh, that is causing me to go away from my relationship, from my walk with God? Are there some of the things that I'm doing? Am I involved in certain things that this does not please God? Um, am I, does that interest me? That, does that tempt me? And am I involved in that? But instead, am I going to say no to all the things of the world that are pleasing to the eyes? Right, uh, that's uh, just so appealing, and say, no, I'm going to say no to all of those things. Instead, I'm going to lay myself on the altar. I'm going to say no because I want to say yes to God. Okay, so that's uh, and that would vary, like I said, from person to person. Like uh, you know, um, in some cases, it might be uh, our desire, our passion, our uh, like there might be one thing that you know you want to do, and then there's another thing that God is telling you to do. Uh, what are you going to do about that? Right? For example, well, let's say, um, okay, I, you know, I want to go and just do my studies in, say, culinary arts. Right? I'm just giving that as an example. Right? That's my, you know, I love cooking and, and whatnot, and there's absolutely nothing following that. And But then somewhere down the line, you know that, okay, you know, God's called you for to, to go on, mission, uh, to be a missionary in so-and-so place. I mean, you know, you know, the voice of God is being very clear to you and whatnot. Um, are you going to say, you know, are you going to lay on the altar saying, okay, Lord, this is what I want to do, but because you have called me, I'm going to say no to my, my personal desires because I want to say yes to you um, so in small things like that it doesn't have to be the big uh, Shri Kumar so in small things every day uh, you know we are called to carry our cross every day die to ourselves every day um, and walking being sensitive to the leading of his voice to the leading of the voice of our shepherd um, every day will help us uh, you know offering ourselves as a living sacrifice that's what it is thank you sir thank you thanks Shikana. i hope it helped yeah thank you sir thank you right uh, thanks elisha for sharing your thought it is my point in today's discussion is it is much important to be laid on the altar as to building an altar 
But please remember, guys, this is all metaphoric in these days, okay? Uh, symbolic, guys. I'm not asking you to go get some bunch of stones and bricks and, and start building all this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Christopher, go ahead. Ah, yes, I'm actually referring to uh, uh, Romans 12, um, 1 okay. uh, in, the, in, in the NKV, I gave you okay. And uh, there's a mention about um, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to understand uh, is it some is it is it uh, where God is saying that uh, based on the on some on you know your limitations. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what 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 is, what is meant by reasonable uh, reasonable service. Okay, uh, can I just quickly uh, read for us uh, from the message version? Um, yeah, I heard not so. So uh, I feel like there's one second, please, if you don't mind, Christopher. Okay, uh, I'm, I'll paste it in the chat section. Yes. Um, so this is from the message version. I uh, I, I kind of like it because it's very simple. So it says, here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Um, I I think that makes a lot more uh, sense, uh, right, Christopher? I mean, also to Shri Kumar. Yeah, is take everyday things, uh, and and when we talk about worship, we say worship is a lifestyle, isn't it? And this is what it is in NIV uh, in Romans chapter twelve, verse one. It says, "This is your act of worship," um, and so we live in surrender, in absolute surrender. Um, that simply is. Our act of worship as being on the altar, complete surrender. Yeah. All right. I no. I just just wanted to. Uh, um, I, I mean, understand this this particular. Um, I mean, what the question that you that you put, uh, put across. But I, I just want to understand a little more about the reasonable. Uh, uh, you know, um, the word reasonable. Um, okay. Where, where God has, um, I can't remember the the actual verse, but um, you know, where God doesn't give you more than you can you can you can handle, um, and uh, again, uh, as you as we grow uh, in in our spiritual walk, yeah, we get strengthened and then we can you know we can we can stretch ourselves even more. But yeah. I, I'm saying at a particular instant. Uh, our instance, our instance of time, um, there is a there is a certain uh, uh, you know aspect of uh, where you know where God is providing uh, is giving you that uh, uh, you know that um, objective of you know what the the level of service and it just it is it is reasonable it is something that that we can we can do. Yeah, uh, as in, 
yeah, when you put it like that, yeah. Uh, but also when I read uh, the message version, like you know what you said, uh, you know, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, all of that uh, sounds pretty reasonable to me. <laughs> Is like when I when I offer all of those things uh, and live in surrender of those small mundane things, um, those can be considered as a reasonable service as an act of worship. So. All right, guys. Uh, well, thank you for hanging around. Uh, I hope you had a, a good time. Um, thank you all for sharing. Uh, yeah, Asha is sharing. I have learned and grasped about the altar, how we can encounter through our worship, testimony, and communion. It also wants our heart, our trust, obedience, our faith. It's like Abraham when we when he went to sacrifice his son. He wanted Abraham's heart. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Asha. Thanks for typing that out. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, for today's session. I'll see you all once again next week. Okay, take care. Have a blessed week. God bless you. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. You're blessed. Thank you, Rupa. Bless you. <laughs>